Did any of this look familiar to you? So most of these came from the book. I think they were in the, some of them were on the online homework as well. Um, which, not that I'm lazy, I mean I, I am, but um, <laughs> that's not the reason that I take them from the book exclusively. I, it's also incentive for you to do the problems from the book because they'll show up on things like quizzes and exams. All right, let's go through these. Um, so what's happening in this one is kind of an overall synthetic route. What is the thing that's changing? Uh, what, are you, what do you have to do overall? Not specific reagents, but overall in this first one. Yeah, you have to change the position of the alcohol. All right. It starts here, and it moves over here. Now, what is <coughs> slightly uh, confounding this one is just that it's flipped the other way. Right. And I didn't do that to trick you. I did that because sometimes that's how these things work, is you have, um, you're thinking in one way that you want to get this molecule over to this one, uh, but the other one is in a different orientation. You have to be able to manipulate those sorts of things in your head so that doesn't trip you up. So we look at it that way, it's really sort of moving over. And this is something that we looked at quite a bit last week, right? Moving a functional group it was kind of the first synthetic things that we talked about. So what uh, general steps are you going to take to do this? Right, so you gotta create, you got to make a double bond so that you can then get the OH from the double bond. So working backwards before we get the reagents in here, this is, is going to be made from the addition of water, the anti-Markovnikov addition of water. And then we can make this from the elimination of that alcohol, either through dehydration or um, through uh, other elimination. So this one will be some kind of hydroboration, oops, oxidation, and this one will be whatever your favorite uh, condition. Now in this case, it's a little bit, you have to be a little bit careful here. You can't do a standard dehydration. Why not? Right. If you try, you'll need to use a leaving group and a large base because if you use just acidic conditions and, and do the dehydration, you'll form the other alkene, the, the more substituted alkene. If we want the less substituted alkene, which is this one, we need to make sure to pick the right conditions. So we're going to make that alcohol into a leaving group. And either today or on Wednesday, we're going to learn some new ways to make alcohols into leaving groups as well. And then we're going to eliminate that with some large base to make sure that we get the less substituted alkene. Okay. So if you want to draw it out like this, great. If you just listed it, you know, one, two, three, four, that's fine too, as long as everything's in order. If you do write it out as it says here, I can give you a little bit I can be a little bit more generous in partial credit because I can see if maybe you just screwed yourself up by drawing the wrong structure at some point. If it's just the list, I've just got to grade you on the list. No, that will give you the wrong substitution. Well, it'll be more selective to the other alkene because of the smaller base. You need something big and bulky. I would say something at least this big. Um, if you want something even better, those big nitrogen bases, uh, DBN, DBU, are even better choices. OK. Um, now, this one is kind of interesting for a couple of reasons. Um, if we look backwards here, well, first of all, one, once again, what's the overall philosophy here? What are we doing in a sort of general way? You're making the aldehyde, and are you changing the carbon skeleton? Yeah. By what? One. One. So you're adding one carbon. So is this a good candidate for um, <clears throat> using an alkyne? Well, it kind of has to be, right? Because that's really the way to, that we know so far on how to add carbons. Uh, that's going to change in this next chapter. What's the problem with the standard alkyne addition? Well, first of all, can you make aldehydes from alkynes? Yeah, we know that, right? But is that what's happening here? No. Why not? Uh, because we've got to go from the alkyne to the alkene, from the alkene, we can slice it and add these carbon. Yeah, because we have to cut a carbon off, right? 
That's why. So if, and this is where the retrosynthesis works to your favor. If you think, okay, I can get an aldehyde from an alkyne, so I'm going to do this, or excuse my bond angles. That's the alkyne that that would come from. But it's not clear now how to get this alkyne from here, because that would be just leave it, just adding one carbon, which we can't do. Right? This, this only has one carbon more than this. So instead, we have to think of a different route. And this is always fine to do when you're doing these problems. First, try something out, see if it works. If it doesn't work, try something different. If that's not going to work, then what's something else that we can get um, aldehydes from? Yeah, from ozonolysis. So if we had a double bond here, right, that could be done with ozonolysis. And your favorite uh, reductive conditions, what did you put here? Anybody? Bisulfide or dimethyl sulfide? Yeah. Okay. And now, where does this come from? So now think of the synthesis this way. This is now two carbons bigger than this, right? <coughs> Which is a candidate for uh, the acetylide chemistry. So let's say that comes from a reduction of the alkyne. And in this case, either conditions would be fine because it does, there's no cis-trans problem here. So let's say we use hydrogen and then let's say, all right, well, we put that on from the substitution, something like this. And then this can be done with the radical addition of HBr. Okay. Questions about that? So again, you know all these steps? But it could certainly trick you if you're not counting your carbon skeleton right. It would be very easy to just think, oh, i got to add my acetylene, and then I'm going to do hydroboration and get my aldehyde. I mean, that's the obvious answer. But the obvious answer isn't right in this case. So please keep track of your carbon atom accounting. OK, and the final one, once again, uh, we want to work backwards here, although in this one it's probably actually pretty easy, obvious if you work forwards as well. Um, why is that? Why is the forwards direction somewhat obvious in this case? Yeah. yeah. Right, you got to get a double bond, cut it in half. And there's only really one thing that can react with plain old unsubstituted alkenes, or alkanes, and that's what? Yeah, well, um, bromine, but yeah, some kind of radical process, either bromine or chlorine, is really the only thing that you can react with um, an unsubstituted alkane. Uh, in this case, we want that selectivity. So let's work backwards just because that's how we've been doing it anyway. Uh, wh what is this probably coming from? Yeah, an ozonolysis to open the ring. So let's make sure we actually get the right ring, right? Because who knows? So we've got, if this connects with this one, or if this was connected with that and that's what broke apart, that's a one, two, three, four, five carbon ring. Okay, so that makes sense because that's what we've got here. Right, so that was a five carbon ring and then carbon one, the still works, still good to number these. Carbon one has the methyl group coming off of it. See that? 
And then the double bond is between carbon 1 and carbon 5, the way that we've drawn it here. Now, of course, that's the same structure as if the bond were between 1 and 2. But doing it this way, if this were a more complicated problem, you would need to do that. So don't take for granted or don't assume that because you see this ring opening that that's the ring that's opened. Right? We've seen some reactions last semester where a six-membered ring becomes a five-membered ring or a five-membered ring becomes a six-membered ring through uh, cation rearrangement. So don't automatically assume that that's the thing. Count it out. You know. It could be. That's just how I numbered it. Yeah, They're both the same molecule. Okay, and then this one, the double bond comes from elimination. Now, it could come from a couple different eliminations. The bromine could be on these other carbons as well, but those wouldn't be easy to make from the starting material. So we stick with this one because this would be selective uh, through radical bromination. carbon would be selected. Okay? Questions? Alright, so keep practicing this kind of stuff. Like I said, this book is pretty good about it. The next chapter has a whole section about in the back about how the new reactions are going to apply to synthesis. Um, it's going to continue to be a theme through the whole semester and they're going to get very complex. Okay, the first, the chapter of your book actually starts with naming. Um, I think we sort of know how to name alcohols. We'll talk about some specifics if we need to. But how, oh, that's not a good way to start. Let's start with this one. How would you name this alcohol? Cyclopentanol, right. Good. That's about it. I mean, it's one of the simplest naming things, right? You just put the thing on the end with the alcohol. Okay. What about this? All right, best way to name this is 1,3-cyclohexadiol. All right, we got six carbons there. The numbers go in front, and then the di actually goes at the end. So it's not dicyclohexanol. That would um, sort of imply that there were two cyclohexanols together. It's cyclohexadiol, uh, not cyclohexa, sorry, this is wrong. Hang on. Cyclohexane. Diol. That tells you it's a cyclohexane with two alcohols, diol, and the one three tells you, of course, one and three. Um, if they were right next to each other, they would be one two, apart from each other one four, and those are the only cyclohexane diols. Okay, what about this one? This is phenol or phenol. So alcohols and phenols have various properties, and we'll we'll talk about some different ones. Um, what about numbering? I made my nice angles into. Curves, but that's all right. We get the idea. You'd start with the double bond, or you start with the alcohol. Close. The alcohol actually gets the priority here. Um, and why is that? I mean, it's just a convention. It's not like there's some chemical reason. But generally, um, oxygen-based functional groups 
take precedent over carbon-based functional groups. So alcohols, ketones, aldehydes, carboxylic acids tend to get the priorities over the others. When does the rule of, like, you're supposed to have all substituents the lowest number possible? When, no, when none of them have a functional group priority. So, like, uh, if you had a structure that just had um, halogens and alkyl groups, methyl, ethyl, whatevers, yeah. those don't aren't considered functional groups, per se. So they don't get numbering priority, so you just go with whatever gives you the lowest numbers. When you have something like an alkene, or an alcohol, or a carboxylic acid, or a aldehyde, those things, then you go with those as the lowest number. Uh, what are you dealing with, like nitrogen and sulfur? Uh, nitrogen and sulfur should count like this. Uh, priority? Priority, and do they I take, believe. Do they take precedence over alcohol, or uh, oxygen? Uh, good question. I don't know, we'll have to look at that one. I don't remember. Um, yeah, yeah. my guess is maybe that it would go by atomic number. Um, is that true? Yeah. Okay. So if you had a, a halogen on there, like a chloride, then, like, say you had it. Yeah, well, that's the exception to atomic number, is the halogens tend to take lower priority. So <laughs> that's why I'm not sure about the others, if that's actually a rule or not. Uh, we'll look it up. We'll, we'll find out. But this should be numbered 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And should therefore be named what? You guys mean this? Well, it's a 6 heptene two all, and then that would be a five, five, six trimethyl, six heptene, two all. Okay. So the locant, or the number that tells you where the alcohol is, if it's in something complicated like this, that can go right next to the all for clarity. If it's something not particularly, particularly complicated, like this, that locant is usually at the beginning. So this would be um, three hexanol or hexan three all. Those are both acceptable names. Yes. Yes, so the six could go here also if you thought that that was clear. And then uh, you, can you use hydroxy instead of all? Um, if it's very compli complicated, or not, not very complicated, you use hydroxy in place of all when there are other higher uh, priority functional groups. So like if there's a ketone or an aldehyde or something, that's what you would name it over. That's what you would name it after, and then it would be hydroxy. Um, let's see if I can find any examples of that that are easy to access. Well, we'll look them up. That's all right. Okay, how about this one? Give that one a try, see if you can come up with a name on your own. All right, so here are the guesses. The issues I have with this first one this substituent is not benzyl. What is this substituent called? This is phenyl. What is benzyl? It's really confusing. Benzyl. 
benzyl includes the carbon next to the benzene ring. Phenyl is just the ring by itself. Benzyl is the ring plus a carbon. The benzylic position is the carbon next to the benzene. So can you go Yes. But you also went the wrong way on that. Because if you were including both of these, then it would be ethane would be left. Right? There's just there's only three carbons outside of the benzene here. So this should be, yeah, but a better way to name this is actually 3-phenyl-2-chloro-propanol. Whoops. Okay, apparently I cannot... So this, this, this name has a couple issues. There's not a cyclohexene here. That's, that's a benzene. That's a phenyl. Uh, and it doesn't account for the three carbons coming off of here. Uh, and then also functional groups go at the end, not at the beginning. Sub, uh, substituents go at the beginning. You don't have a special of what? Right, it's assumed one unless you put something else. So you would, you could put something here. You could say propane one all, but if that number is not there, it's the one is assumed. Or you could put it up here. Well, okay, I numbered them backwards. Sorry. One, two, three. Okay. That was a little rough. Let's try another one. Yes, sorry, go ahead. What? Three carbons with the alcohol in one. Uh, yes, okay. So it's, uh, uh, let me redraw it here. So here's the stereo center, right? Uh, top priority group is the chlorine for molecular weight. Second is the oxygen, or is the carbon connected to an oxygen. Third is carbon connected to another carbon in the phenyl group. Remember, you don't actually you don't look at the whole group for what's bigger for priority. It's just one atom away, and then one more step if it's tied. All right. So one, two, three. Yeah. And then we should also put in the, it's not drawn, but there's a hydrogen on the wedge here. So we would go one to two to three, go around. And if you go one to two to three this way, that's like turning your car which direction? To the left or to the right? To the left. But the lowest priority group is in front, so that means you have to flip it. So it's left, you flip it because so, the lowest priority group is in front, so that's an R overall. Yeah, yeah make sure you're... Um, probably not something you thought about in a little while, so make sure you're reviewing that as well. Other questions about those? All right, should we try one more naming one? Or go on? Yeah, let's do one more. All right, let's do one more. I'm going to get a page.
Is that one all right? All right, let's try it again. We'll uh, we'll type in whatever you want to type in. What do you, what do you have? What you said? Uh, oh, we. Yeah, no, not yeah, that's right. That's right? Okay, is that right? No. What's wrong about it? Six ethyl? Yeah. So you're going to change your answer yeah, for that? Okay. Okay, what about now? Is it is it correct now? Yeah. Oh, it's wrong now. Yeah. No? What, what, what else is wrong with it? Anyway. It's an octanol, not a nonanol? Why? Yeah, the longest chain goes here. So we'll go one, two, three, four. Are the stereo centers right? Are they both R? Yep, looks good to me. Nice job. That's fine. You're close. Close doesn't count on the MCAT, so you know, make sure you got that that down, right? That that methyl probably is an answer on. It's probably like C, right? Well, I don't. I mean, I doubt it because like I just didn't see the the second for what other. No, just keep making excuses. It's fine. <laughs> Did I not have my... Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. Um, all right, that's naming. Let's start talking about some properties of alcohols now. What, um, what are some important physical properties of alcohols? Like, for instance, what's the difference between... Ethane and ethanol. What does the alcohol on there do to it due to the physical properties? Let's draw these here. What's the difference between ethane? And ethanol. What does adding that alcohol do to the physical thing, the physical properties of these molecules? More reactive, sure. Is that's not really a physical property, though, right? That's a chemical property. What? Yeah. So that's a big one. Here's ethane, and here's ethanol. Ethane is a gas with a boiling point of minus 89 degrees C. Uh, ethanol is a liquid with a boiling point of 78 degrees C. Is that because of the extra mass that the, that the oxygen adds? No. No. It's from the hydrogen bonding. And to prove that, we can look at a, well, not to prove it, but to show that, we can look at a kind of an intermediate member here. Which is chloroethane. And chloroethane has a higher molecular weight than ethanol, but a lower boiling point. That's also a gas at room temperature. So it's the hydrogen bonding. That's really to blame here, or to. But wouldn't the 12 degrees Celsius for the chloral um, ethane also be the, um, the, sorry, 
Bolton. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which again, uh, you can look at things like propane and butane, which now have those larger molecular weights but don't have polarity, and those are still gases at, at room temperature. Right. Um, as well. So, yeah, there's some polarity here, but one thing that we forget about is we think of we tend to think of chlorine as a really electronegative element that makes these strong dipole moments. But compared to the hydrogen bonding realm, compared to oxygen and nitrogen, uh, it, it's really not that polar. Chloroalkanes like dichloromethane or chloroform are not particularly polar solvents. They're not. They won't even mix with water. So, um, so the chlorine really that dipole. Those dipole interactions are much less of an effect with an element like chlorine than something like hydrogen bonding. So it's a much stronger, much stronger physical effect there. Okay, now let's look at some of the chemical properties. One thing we want to certainly address is alcohol acidity. What's the pH of a stand or pKa of a standard alcohol? Like an ROH. What what's the pKa there? Yeah, like about like 16. Now this is yeah. 15 to 16 like water. These are this is a good one to keep in your head. There's no reason to memorize an entire pKa table, but you want to know some of the key ones. You want to know that alcohols are about 16, water is about 16. And then you should be able to use your chemical intuition, your chemical logic, your skills to estimate the pKa on one side or another. So for instance, um, hang on a second, okay. Here's ethanol, which does have a pKa of just about 16. And here is trichloroethanol. What would you estimate the pKa of trichloroethanol at? Higher. Maybe higher or lower? You said higher? Yes. Okay, why higher? Because the chloral is going to um, better, yeah, it's going to better. Um, it's going to be a weaker base because the, the like if, if, if the conjugate base of that is going mm -hmm. to be a lot weaker because of the inductive effect with the chloral being able to grab some of the negative charge from the oxygen. Yes, exactly right. Almost. That part. That part's all right. Yeah, is it inverse or is it yes. But let's talk about that. But but all the reasons you gave were were great. So let's talk about those first. Here's the conjugate base, right? Those chlorines help to stabilize that conjugate base by inductively delocalizing that charge, pulling it back a little bit. Stabilized due to the inductive effect. But if you stabilize the base, what does that do to the acid? Does it make it stronger or weaker? Right. So the weaker base means that on the other side of that equili equilibrium, you would have a stronger acid. And that's what we've got up there. Uh, so this pKa is actually 12.2. So it's quite effective. And this is, this is logic that is very easy to get all mixed up because you think, oh, the chlorine stabilizes it, so that makes it weaker. Or, you know, it's just easy to get mixed around. So um, I, I recommend always using a standard approach to how you determine acid strength. My standard approach is look at the conjugate base and see how the conjugate base is affected. Okay? That's always what I do. And then I know that I can look at the conjugate base decide if that's stabilized or destabilized, and then 
take that logic back uh, to the opposite acid logic. So if the, if the base is stabilized, the acid must be destabilized, so stronger acid overall. What about this? Here's cyclohexanol. versus phenol. What's the stronger base here? Is the cyclohexanol stronger or the phenol stronger? Stronger base. Did I say stronger base? Yeah. No, acid. So which one's the strongest acid? OK. Why the phenol? That's right. But be careful. It's not this that's resonance stabilized. It's the conjugate base is resonance stabilized. So if you have to write that um, like on an exam or something, justifying why something is more stable, make sure that you're clear that it's in fact the conjugate base that's more stable because this charge can be delocalized through the benzene ring, through resonance. Mm -hmm. like, we're, we're saying that, like, because well, cause what you're saying in here is like, because it's a, because it's a, uh, con the conjugate base mm -hmm. is weaker, makes it a stronger acid, but could you, like, look, could you label why the actual acid itself is the stronger acid? Not really without taking account of the conjugate base. Okay. Because it's all together, it's equilibrium, so it's all tied together. The way you would talk about it with just the acid yeah. is yeah. you would say things like the OH bond is weaker. So the hydrogen can fall off more easily. But why is the OH bond weaker? Because the equilibrium favors the other side. Right? Chemical reactions are always at equilibrium. They're always going back and forth. They're just favoring one side or the other. So when we talk about an acid being stronger or weaker, really all we're saying is which side is the equilibrium on more, the acid side or the base side. And you can only really do that comparatively for different molecules. Um, the only acids that we say absolutely are just strong acids are the ones where the equilibrium is totally on one side, which is hydrochloric acid, nitric acid, sulfuric acid, none of these organic uh, molecules at all. So otherwise, it's always a sort of equilibrium argument. So it always works to talk about the conjugate base. Um, OK. So yes, this is actually true. Uh, the pKa of this, I don't know offhand, but it's, oh, I do know. It's 18. Okay, I don't know, but it was in my notes, so. <laughs> so that, that pKa is 18, and this pKa, I do know, this one is 10. So a significant difference. And the resonance effect you see here is far greater than the inductive effect from those three chlorines above. That would be more even uh, were it fluorine. Fluorine is highly electronegative, but chlorine, it has an effect, certainly, but not as big an effect as the resonance effect. And we'll see that in a bunch of stuff this semester when we talk about reactivity and whether something is favored or something else is favored, usually the resonance effect is much, much greater than any inductive effect, the exception being fluorine, generally. OK. So that said, let's do a little problem to finish up, and then we'll, we'll save the reactions for Wednesday. We got two compounds here, two alcohols. This one A and this one B. Which one is more acidic? And why? OK, let's be more specific. So yes, you're right. A is more acidic because of resonance. But what specifically is going on with the resonance that makes A more acidic? Because here's where they, they both have resonance structures, but I'm sorry. Yeah, no, you're right. 
Um, but A, uh, if he interacts with the, the uh, negative charge on the oxygen, when it becomes fixed. Right. So here's where people get screwed up on this usually in the exams that I've created. Uh, people will see something like this and they'll say A is more acidic because of resonance. There's not really a full credit answer. Resonance means lots of things. I mean, it's fine for, you know, when we're just jumping stuff out, it's great. But on an exam, because of resonance isn't an answer. Um, what exactly is the resonance doing to stabilize something about something to bring something in lower energy and ultimately make that, I don't know, I just confused myself, so I'm sure I just confused you, but you get the idea that just because of resonance isn't an answer. What is the resonance doing to stabilize something relative to something else? So um, what uh, Mick was saying, that's your name, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, OK, it's the first, second week. I'm still confusing people, but I, I know that. What? No. Close, though. It's actually Joe. Yeah. Um, so yes, it's the conjugate base that is stabilized by resonance. So let's look at these conjugate bases. We'll talk about it later. Uh, it's very complicated. It's hard to say. You have to pronounce it just right. And no, that's worse, actually. That's no, that's no. Yeah, it's an. I know it's a rare name. It's hard to pronounce. We'll we'll talk about it later. Um, so we look at these two conjugate bases and say, what exactly is stabilized? How how is resonance affecting it? And if you look here. I think you can see that in this case, yes, there's resonance around this ketone, but it doesn't have anything to do with that negative charge on the oxygen. So it's not helping or hurting or doing anything to that molecule. In this case, you can clearly see how resonance allows you to delocalize that negative charge through this entire molecule by passing it all the way over to the, the other oxygen and also, there's an additional resonance form where the negative charge is on the carbon as well. So that negative charge is completely delocalized through three atoms, making this much more stable of a conjugate base. And. Uh, So again, if you were to predict the pKa's of these two molecules, just give me some numbers, what would you say is probably the pKa of B? Let's start with B. Yeah, something 16 to 18 is probably reasonable. Right? If, you know, something in the 16 to 18 range is fine. We don't know exactly. It's some alcohol. There's some other stuff there, so that's going to affect it in some way. Um, maybe a little lower, maybe 15. I don't know. What about A? Where would you put the pKa there? Yeah, something like maybe 10 to 12. We can't really say that with certainty. We don't know, but we know it's going to be less than the other one. But that gives us a reasonable range. I mean, that's a, actually a pretty good estimate, estimate of what those things would be. We know it's not going to be quite as acidic, probably, as phenol because of that extraordinary aromatic, uh, we'll talk about that in another chapter, but that, that ring system gives you lots of delocalization. Um, but it's certainly going to be much more acidic than this one. So that uh, gives us a sense of that. And remember also that the pKa scale is logarithmic, right? pKa is the log of something. So each number on the pKa is actually times 10 in actual concentration of, of H+. So a difference of just a couple numbers in pKa is really significant. It's actually a couple thousand. You know, it's, some, it's on the order of thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands times of the, the concentration. OK, any questions about that before we stop? All right, let's head upstairs. And we'll try to get started around 5 to 2. So take about 10 minutes.